Conversations with Strategy in the Department of War Jason, Studies. Um, just if you just hold off a few seconds, oh, I sorry. Think the attendees coming in. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session on conversations with strategy in the Department of War Studies in the School of Security Studies, King's College London. I'm Dr. Stacey Gutkowski, Senior Lecturer in Conflict Studies and Co-Director of the Center for the Study of Divided Societies. Um, and joining us today, we're very happy to welcome Dr. Roxanne farman farmain She is a visiting senior fellow in the Center for the Study of Divided Societies here at King's. She's a scholar of international relations, specializing in the foreign and security dimensions of the Middle East and in the media. She is Director of International Relations and Global Studies at the University of Cambridge Institute of Continuing Education and lecturer on modern Middle East politics at the Cambridge Department of Politics and International Studies. She's a Senior Associate Fellow of the European Leadership Network and a member of the European Council on Foreign Relations, Women and Security Dialogue. She was a resident fellow at the Netherlands Institute of Advanced Studies between 2008 and 19, where she finalized a new model for theorizing media in the Middle East. In 2013, she received a five-year, 680,000 pound grant from Al Jazeera Media Corporation to study media and politics in the Southern Mediterranean, focusing on Tunisia, Morocco, and Turkey after the Arab uprisings. She's a recipient of ESRC and Annenberg Foundation uh, for Communication Awards. She was a founder of the Polis Space Center for International Relations of the Middle East and North Africa at Cambridge and previously editor of the Cambridge Review of International Affairs. Um, we're gonna start the conversation with her, her earlier experience, um, which is prior to becoming an academic, she was an international reporter covering the Soviet Union, Iran, women's business, and the high-tech media industry. She's a frequent public speaker, opinion writer, policy um, commentator and television commentator on the Middle East, um, and on its political and international affairs. Thank you so much, Roxanne, for joining us today. We're really delighted to have you. So you've worn many hats over the course of your career as a, as a journalist, as a high-level policy consultant, as an academic, and I, I hope we're gonna get to touch on all of those uh, things. Um, but perhaps we can go back to the beginning uh, with your an experience as a journalist during the Iranian Revolution. Um, what do you remember most vividly about the time and what can you tell us um, about how you came to uh, found and run Iranian, a weekly news magazine, um, which served as an important source of information for a foreign press and diplomatic corps in Tehran between 1979 and 1980? Well, it was a very vivid time, as you can imagine. And thank you so very much for having me. Let me first put that out there. It's a real pleasure and it's wonderful to be a uh, visiting fellow at King's. So I, I, I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you, Stacy, and to look back on that period, which uh, is already now some, some decades ago. And I was uh, quite fresh out of university. My father, uh, was Iranian, my mother was American, and I had gone to university in the United States. So I thought, okay, I shall go and do my first work in uh, Iran and find out what it was like, and arrived there just as it was having a revolution. And to be honest, the only companies that hired during a revolution uh, are the media companies because they need people to go out into the streets. So it was an extremely exciting time, quite dangerous. And I worked for the uh, big, English language newspaper there uh, until it closed very, very soon after I arrived. And then uh, a number of us got together, young whippersnappers and um, started our own magazine. It seemed so doable at the time. <laughs> and um, we tried to make it, we, we thought of ourselves as a very mini version, a revolutionary version of the New Statesman. We sort of went out and tried to have a really important interview uh, and uh, with somebody at the time, it was a weekly 
And we really just tried to cover as many aspects of the oil news, of the demonstrations. And, uh, and it, was, it was an extraordinary time because nobody, I think, as we look back on uh, where Iran and the United States particularly have ended up since, it was an amazing time to witness how everyone in Iran at the time really was quite behind the revolution. There wasn't a whole lot of debate about whether everybody wanted the Shah to go. What was of debate is what to create afterwards. And so I think in many ways, I encountered the idea of a divided society, which has been part of my experience ever since because there was definitely a whole group of people that wanted to go and have a sense of comfort, a sense that Islam could give back as the authenticity and possibly the commandments that, had, uh, that would help create a new society after the Shah's uh, experience. I don't think that there was a great deal of debate either about the fact that people wanted free expression, they wanted individual liberties, but those were much more abstract. And um, the Islamic dimension and the form of community that it offered was something that people at the time could hold on to. And this was something my office, luckily, from the magazine that we started was somehow right between the United States Embassy on one end of the road, I mean, several blocks down, and the university that was on the other end of the road, several blocks down. So we got to see basically the entirety of the street prayers and the um, demonstrations. And of course, once the embassy was seized in the hostage crisis, that we were in many ways on a front seat of that. So it was an opportunity also to see enormous misunderstanding between two countries. And I would say that that actually has been the tragedy of Iran. It was not that they got, didn't get the government that they wanted, but they didn't anticipate that the government they got would have such a long and toxic relationship and misunderstanding with the world's greatest unipolar power at that time. And that has been the great tragedy of the, of the Iranian situation. It's amazing to hear how you were right there on, you know, on the cusp of history, right on the road. I mean, that is, yeah. that is absolutely amazing. Um, if some of our students found themselves in a similar situation, you know, in the context of history evolving around them, you know, how would you, what, what would you suggest to them? How would you go about doing something similar to what you did? Well, I think in any case, we all find ourselves in new settings and new challenges and often new crises. And so um, I think the, the opportunity that students should always be aware of is uh, the one that's right there in front of them and to jump in. And often it may seem well, slightly crazy, I'm sure, um, slightly I think all of us feel as though we we suffer from something called imposter syndrome, where we don't feel we're well enough equipped or we don't have the background. And the only way to get that is by jumping in and doing it. And so I think I didn't know anything about writing. I didn't know anything about editing. And yet I had a confidence that I was a relatively good writer and I got along with people and I had a nose for what I was curious about. And I think to follow your intellectual curiosity is really important. So my next step after Iwan was I ended up going to Moscow right as the Soviet Union was falling apart. Um, and um, I was there in 1984. I mean, it was just the moment that all of that was happening and the book had been long ago anticipating that those dates. And, um, and it was a fascinating time. And I was a journalist during that period as well. And it was not easy because the Soviet Union was, uh, anytime a country is falling apart is usually when it's most difficult, it's very scared. It tends to shut down. It tends to try to repress and control. And um, so it was really an opportunity for me to try something new. And so I took up photography as well. It just seemed like an easier way to, to capture some of the things that were going on. And again, I was not a, you know, a born photographer. I unfortunately was unable to take that up as, as I went forward, but I was able to run around with an awful lot of photojournalists and thereby see different dimensions of what was going on as the country was beginning to fall apart. 
And, um, and that too was something that I think very much shows that you can do it. I think it's really important as students to go forward, to grab the bull by the horns. And you may be convinced that it's not something you want to do or that you've got other strengths, but you won't know until you've actually worked in something and given it a try. What were your sort of your main observations? Are there any kind of anecdotes or something from, from that period um, watching the Soviet Union start to disintegrate? Well, actually having come from Iran and then gone to the Soviet Union, when I finally emerged and went back to um, the United States and, and, and arrived in New York, I, I decided I must be a, a journalist of revolutions. And I think since then, I've realized I am an academic of divided societies, actually. But they are, in a sense, different versions of the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so when I um, got to the United States, I was more confident in the skills that I had built and felt that I could uh, contribute in an area uh, that was, again, new. And I had a certain confidence about being able to uh, process new materials and new ideas and meet new groups of people. And I had a certain confidence in that. So I think that in some ways is one of the anecdotes is that I came away from particularly Moscow where there were a great number of journalists that were pouring in at any given moment and getting to know them and realizing there were many different styles of journalism and many different audiences and viewpoints. And my viewpoint was very different than many of those that did arrive. And, and being located there, I had a different perspective as well than people that were coming in from the outside. And so when I got to the States, um, what was just happening, again, it just seems like another era was the beginning of the tech uh, revolution. So that was the era of the Apple II that arrived. We didn't have um, uh, cell phones. And I, so what I did was I joined a magazine that was beginning to report on uh, the tech industry, which was a great place to be because every six months or every five months, a new machine would arrive or a whole new kind of machine would arrive. And uh, we rapidly cycled through the, the, the quick development of the tech industry so that when I left just a few years later, having been snapped up by several different magazines in turn, because everybody needed somebody that knew something about the tech industry. And although I rapidly also realized it was not going to be the specialty. I'm not a tech person. And in fact, I'm disastrous at it now. But I, um, I realized that I knew enough about how it was working with society, that it was one of the things I could bring real value to for a while. And so one of the first really ex extremely interesting programs that I did was AT&T developed the first touchscreen technology. And I was working at the time for a magazine that's now died called Working Woman, which was really at the forefront of helping women understand how to move into management and, and administration and executive positions. And so again, another revolution, if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, AT&T AT uh, partnered with us and I was able to do a wonderful project on eight women uh, who we, we labeled as eight women who had changed the world. So including the very first woman who had ever held a, a seat on the American stock, New York Stock Exchange and that kind of thing. And you could do it all by touch screen. And this was at least 10, 15 years before touch screen actually became commercial. Wow, that's amazing. And you know, it's a very clear thread from studying different kinds of revolutions to this, this new other form yeah. Um, of both technological and, and social revolution. Yes. I wonder, so then how did you start to make the transition towards becoming an academic? You did write another, another book, and I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that transition and, and about the book. Well, I think that in, in having written uh, and reported on what was happening on the streets of Iran. What was clear is the growing division between uh, the United States and Iran, and it didn't really make sense. Uh, there are equal relationships that the United States has with countries that are as abusive or as uh, 
um, incomprehensible, and yet those relationships are quite close simply because they fit within the strategic national interest of the United States. So particularly, let me specify Saudi, which is not any more natural an ally to the United States than Iran would be. And in fact, I would probably argue Iran would be more likely an ally. And yet somehow they were unable to patch up uh, the, the relationship. And I was convinced that something had to, it had something to do with the hostage crisis, but also being someone who, who was a word monger, if you will, somebody who wrote and reported and dealt with uh, language. I felt that there was something about how the meanings of uh, the exchange had been uh, amplified to the point where it was very difficult to get over the assumptions and the associations the other had. So I did start by writing a book uh, with my father about his memoirs. He was the, um, a, a high executive in the oil industry and in fact was the original Iran delegate to what, what became OPEC. And so he had some extraordinary uh, perspectives to bring to the story as well. And uh, he also, during the revolution, one of the things I experienced, and certainly one of the things he experienced, is he had to walk out uh, of the border, across the border, to save his life. And so he had extraordinary stories. And so I helped him write a book. His first language was not English. And um, so together we wrote a book called uh, Blood and Oil Memoirs of a Persian Prince, because he was from a large family that in the past was royal. And um, it was published by Random House, and I thought, and that involved an enormous amount of research into the British archives and all sorts of things. And it went a long way to understanding a great deal more, but I felt I still wasn't there. So um, a wonderful professor uh, in Cambridge, Peter Avery, who was known as an Iran specialist uh, at um, King's College in Cambridge, uh, invited me to come in for a fellowship. And I had never gotten a master's. And I thought, I think better would be to spend that year and if they'll take me to come in for an MPhil. So I did. And I arrived three days before 9-11. Mm -hmm. So before classes had even started, I, was, I found myself in the politics department uh, weighing in on some <laughs> relation, some recommendation one of the professors had to give to some of their contacts about now what does the world do, and very rapidly uh, was um, invited before I'd really even embarked very much on the masters, the MPhil, to to do a PhD on that very concept of the relationship between. Uh, Iran, in my particular case, but the Middle East more generally, democracy and Islam. And um, so I was, I received a, thank goodness, a, a, a wonderful scholarship for that and spent the next four, five years almost uh, completing the PhD and trying to figure out what was it that really made the difference. And I remember um, presenting my, some of my last uh, years PhD to a PhD group, which you sat in on, Stacy. I remember and, your paper. <laughs> and you made a statement about shame and pride and um, emotions that sent me back at that last moment back to the library to find oh. <laughs> some further insight. And it was actually very critical to my overall thesis. It was like that, that touchstone that I was missing. Oh, wow. And it really made a difference to making a whole theory about emotion and, and international relations. Now it's become uh, quite common. Effect, uh, the effective turn is what mm. it's called, is quite common in IR. But at the time, it was really quite new. A lot of people thought, oh, there's a woman writing about emotion again. <laughs> and, um, and I think actually explains a great deal about the ongoing inability of what I thought was very much a special relationship between Iran and the United mm -hmm. States under the Shah. And there's, and there's no worse relationship in a way than a love affair gone wrong. And I think in many ways that sums up where we are with Iran and the US at the moment.
Mm. And once at Cambridge, I just sort of never left. <laughs> <laughs> it's I, I was thinking of your work actually, you know, um, during the, you know, when the, um, the nuclear deal was signed mm. about how, you know, how these things um, were, were evolving and what is, you know, very much, yeah, a, re a relationship and, um, and evolving and, and very emotional. So once you once you got your PhD, then you know you had you had had this trajectory coming through as a journalist, and then post PhD, in addition to being an academic, you've done all this policy consultancy, which is something a lot of our students, you know, are are interested in and want mm -hmm. to go on and do. Um, sort of how did you build that line of interest and you know what would you suggest to students who want to move into that world well i had always done some uh policy work because i think um when you're involved with with certainly controversial politics or countries that people find very confusing they will often ask journalists for uh commentary whether the journalist knows anything about the policy side or not and um, when I finally felt as though I had much stronger roots into um, what gave me confidence to speak about policy and politics and the, and the longer historical relationships uh, about between these two countries and about the United States and the Middle East generally and about issues such as uh, not only oil, but also then the nuclear issue in, in Iran. Um, I think that's when it began more clearly to develop. And I think part of that is that um, to write policy, you need to write a different way than you do as an academic. And my very first uh, approach to that was when in quite a few cases, different committees simply wanted me to comment. And so I was invited to uh, present my findings or my work or something I'd written to panels that were being held by different policy uh, think tanks. And I would suggest that for students, one of the key areas uh, to break in through is by having actually written something that presents a viewpoint that's balanced and that has uh, strong arguments for the position that you're taking. And I think that can often be developed through the networks that you set up. Even if you yourself are not working at a think tank, very likely there are friends, colleagues of yours, student friends that will be. So I think uh, one should never overlook the benefit of, of networking going to various activities, attending various think tanks, for example, seeing how they put things, you know, and then again, as I said er er earlier on, you know, grab the opportunity and go right up and present yourself and offer uh, the fact that you know something about X, that you've actually written something about X, or you are writing something about X, and um, that will at least begin to include you on smaller, closed, um, panels or or groups, and I think that often is the way of, of, of getting in. It's the same way in in media, to to get in as a journalist, it's it's not easy. And and one of the ways is to start writing your own blogs, your own uh, set up your own podcasts, go to something strange. So go someplace strange. Of course, these days that's a little difficult, but it will change. And 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 be the unique writer about something, and that will often be the opportunity to be placed in um, on the string of, of, of stringers. And, and that's how you often will begin uh, to be able to move in and also to be able to move across. You may be a, you know, a, a reporter in one area, but you can't seem to make the jump. Well, that's the way you make the jump is to start writing about other things and really sending them in ask you a little bit um, in more detail about networking, because I think as as women, particularly in the early stages of our careers, we feel, you know, somewhat intimidated sometimes by networking. I know as I get more gray hair, I feel more, you know, confident in it. Um, and I wonder if you have um, some sort of tips for students who say, okay, she says to turn up at events in London. I'm doing that. 
Now what? <laughs> now what? Um, well, first of all, one of the things that I found at Cambridge uh, that helps a lot is that people will form groups right in the university, right in either cross-disciplinary, cross-departmental, or within the department that become what we call reading groups. And that often will bring um, not only the students themselves together, but it gives them the opportunity to either invite people in uh, or to get to know absolutely everybody else in the university that's actually doing that. And one of the things I've always found, and I, I think you probably would agree with this, Stacy, is that we academics uh, often come over as just doing academics when we're talking to our students, but actually we often wear many different hats. And so getting to have uh, academics that come in and speak to you about different things will often thereby open up their uh, networks to you, especially if you express interest um, and some knowledge on things. Um, and so I think it's, the difficulty is it's often that you don't know who you'll meet, who actually opens that door. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, unless you're in and, and speaking to people and, ex and exchanging uh, you know, cards or, or e uh, emails or whatever, you don't have the opportunity to meet that one person out of seven mm -hmm. or 10 that is going to open the door. So it's work. It's work. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, hopefully from the from the aspect of meeting people, it's it's more pleasant work, but it takes skill. It takes mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. I, I'm conscious that we've come up to about the halfway point, and I'm hoping okay. that our, our participants will um, will jump in uh, with your your questions. Roxanne and I will keep going a, a little bit. But if you have any questions, please, would you either pop them in the Q&A box? Um, or, a, or in the chat or um, raise your hand in the, and we'll see you in the participants list and, uh, and call on you. I think um, there look like there might be two or three in the chat. Ah, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you're, okay. Uh, oh. oh, oh, sorry, that's oh. Lizzie. <laughs> okay. Lizzie in the chat, that's okay. Um, but I hope someone will, um, yeah, come. Um, what you call it? Uh, give us, give us your questions. Um, Sorry, I would just want to add to any students attending here that, um, in terms of uh, the School of Security Studies, War Studies, we have a student engagement officer, Sanjana Balu, and a comms team um, who were really interested in ideas that students might have for speakers, for podcast ideas, blogs, that kind of thing. So. Um, you know, always reach out to Sanjana Balu or the comms team um, if you have ideas and want to get involved and do something and we'll try and support you in that. We can't always promise, obviously, but um, we've had some students come forward with um, podcast suge guest suggestions um, and it's really, really helpful because at the end of the day, a lot of students listen to the War Studies podcast. Um, so we want, you know, we want to give you the opportunity to contribute ideas and suggestions for speakers and themes and that sort of thing as well and certainly um we also plan to interview phd students so if you've got a really interesting research project that you're working on then again put yourself forward and we could potentially interview you for the podcast i'll put my email in well and i have to underscore that i think universities themselves are are something to be maximized while you're there. They're multifaceted and they really do offer the opportunity for small group activities, for, for invited speakers, for panels, for all of these different ways of encounter. And I think that makes an enormous difference. From our perspective as, um, as, as teachers, Stacy, I'm sure you two have run into this. Uh, my what turned out to be long relationship with Al Jazeera actually came up by the fact that I had a student, a master student that had come in who mm -hmm. was among the very first um, crew of Al Jazeera when it launched. And he was uh, responsible for developing uh, one of the main uh, online news uh, channels. And um, we just started chatting and it turned out that there was a center for studies in, uh, uh, in Doha, which I had no idea about. And he suggested that 
maybe some of the work I'd done on media might be helpful uh, for them because it was always quite difficult to, to find common ground between the uh, broadcasting company and this Center for Studies. And so I was their first um, visiting fellow. They'd never had one. I sort of suggested that it might be an interesting idea. And there was an enlightened, wonderful director at the time, Dr. Um, the, the, that helped set that up. And um, I think for both of us, it really made a huge difference. So even uh, for us as, as lecturers or for you as students, these are things that, um, that can come unexpectedly. And I have to say he brought on, I would say at least four or five members of the MPhil group that he was in at the time uh, in one way or another into the Al Jazeera family during that period, because it was growing. Mm -hmm. And they were, you know, beneficiaries, but also contributors. Mm -hmm. That's really fascinating, Roxanne. What, can you tell us a little bit more about your observations about Al Jazeera from, from the beginning? Because it's such a, an interesting outlet. It is a very interesting place, uh, and it's in a very interesting country that's obviously gone through quite a bit quite recently. Um, and uh, I think one of the extraordinary things for me was to arrive at a, a channel that was both Arabic and English. And the two were unbelievably different, very much exuding their own cultures, their own linguistic specialties, their own kinds of training, the relationships uh, that were common uh, to their cultures and that were not necessarily completely um, similar. Mm. And yet they had figured out a way probably because it was growing fast when I was there and changing and very popular. It was filling an enormous mm -hmm. niche at the time that hadn't quite yet been defined, but was very, very clearly something that needed to be filled. And of course, Al Jazeera has gone through many changes and has alienated many of the countries mm -hmm. uh, around it um, in its region. And in fact, of course, in the recent um, fallout of the Gulf Cooperation Council and the embargo that was put on Qatar, the, the number one out of, I think there were seven requirements for Qatar to fulfill mm -hmm. before it could rejoin the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, the number one was to get rid of Al Jazeera and that alone helped to um, mm -hmm. rally the people of, of Qatar together and mm -hmm. uh, support what they feel is a very, very important form of identity as well as um, to instrument for the region in general. And what's been interesting is it's Qatar has now been semi reincorporated yeah. back into the GCC. Mm -hmm. uh, Al Jazeera is alive and well. It's perhaps a little less flamboyant than it was before that. It's been a little mm -hmm. bit careful. Uh, all of us mature, <laughs> but it definitely is still uh, very much active and has uh, been successful in many of its international activities as well. So um, it's, it's been, I was always very admiring of Al Jazeera. Its people are well-trained. It operates as a large, but very cohesive organization. And I admire, uh, I was extremely admiring also of its ability to have a separate um, um, center of uh, academic research and uh, to have a place for that. And in fact, that as a think tank is one of the best um, examples of making a niche for itself and becoming well-recognized by the international think tank community. It mm -hmm. often will be indicated as one of the uh, standouts in the world at any given annual assessment. Mm -hmm. And I think it's deserving. So I, um, I'm a fan. I think there's a lot of problems with the country, company as it's moved into its next levels and as is the case with any company and it's certainly undergone major changes, but uh, it's a, an interesting development and certainly sparked large, very professional, non-Western uh, journalism and uh, broadcasting elsewhere. And so there's all sorts of new styles now that are no longer just uh, the Anglo-American. 
Thank you very much for that. We, we actually have a question um, about Al Jazeera um, from Hassan, and he asks, did you face criticism when you were with Al Jazeera? And if so, how did you deal with it? Well, I was sort of in a ideal position. I was never a reporter. I was never on their, um, their journalism side. I was always an academic. I, I served there, as I mentioned, two months as a fellow. And then I received a very large grant from them. In fact, it's the only Arab broadcaster that has ever offered a, string, a, a no strings attached grant to a uh, established educational institution. And, um, and it was no strings. And that was the operative for Cambridge. It would not have been able to accept that. It was uh, a grant like any other. And so uh, I developed a project uh, that was very much looking at media as it had changed after the Arab uprisings. Um, but there was an element of the funding coming from Al Jazeera in the sense that um, at the time, for example, in Egypt, there were three, I think even originally four correspondents that were incarcerated uh, uh, from Al Jazeera mm -hmm. that were incarcerated mm -hmm. by the Egyptian government. And therefore, what had originally been a plan to do research in Egypt, we couldn't do. Uh, so the relationship was definitely a real relationship. They were our funder. We could not go into proper areas in which our academics would be at risk because of the nature of the funder. We couldn't do Algeria because it had closed the office of uh, Al Jazeera um, already almost a decade before the grant was offered. So we couldn't go there. It just simply would have been too dangerous for us, even though in our research, we didn't say, oh, we're you know, academics from Cambridge here on an Al Jazeera funding. That's not what we said, mm -hmm. but we also didn't cover it up. And, and one has to be straightforward. And if there are questions about something, we need to be able to be uh, transparent. Mm -hmm. So um, it did affect our, our coverage to some degree. On the other hand, uh, we did get some criticism in Turkey as it went through quite a bit of change while we were covering it. It, yeah. it moved actually quite significantly from quite an open society to one after the attempted coup in which academics and journalists were being incarcerated, uh, fired in large numbers. And we were, yeah. you know, we were doing research the whole time and uh, spoke out about that but also were able to see different sides. So I feel as though we did the right kind of academic work there by trying to also understand the popularity of somebody um, such as Erdogan, because very much in the West, it was described as, as somebody that was increasingly authoritarian and indeed he was, but how do you actually justify or understand that within the country and that was something that Al Jazeera felt was very important that we understood and presented that side as well. So I feel as though it did help um, in us also realizing that there were multiple sides. After all, Al Jazeera's um, a tagline is the story and the other story. So it was important for us too to understand that that's what we do as, as academics is we provide different sides of a story. Mm. And so interesting, you know, studying the media at these particular uh, historical turning points, it really, it really gives you, you know, the pulse of the society and the pulse, mm. of, the pulse mm. of the politics. I noticed that Charlie has his, his hand up. Charlie, would you like to jump in? Yes, that, that's great. I actually had a message from a, a student and thank you so much. Uh, this conversation is fascinating. Roxanne, your, your story and your father's story is so inspiring and so, such, a, such, a, such a fascinating insight into the politics of the region. And the question actually that student um, Messini, who's on a, my second year course, was asking about, is it the case that even with the attention that has been, that we pay to the Iranian hostage crisis, that even that we, we still sort of underestimate its significance, the way, the way in which it's continued to reverberate. And um, what he was the student was particularly pointing to was that um, in my course, we, we listen, we, we look at Donald Trump's um, the background in politics and his first interview in 1980 occurs around the time of the Iranian hostage crisis and um, he's very much influenced um, 
by what happens there. Steve Bannon is, um, is someone who's a US Marine in, in, in the Middle East at the time. There's, for, for a certain sort of segment of American society, as you mentioned, there's, there's still a sense that that is, is still a sort of a, an open sore. Um, so yeah, do, do you think it's something that we still don't really appreciate? It's such a good question. And if I could uh, begin by saying, I'd love to see that interview of Trump's because I haven't seen that. And, and I would be really fascinated to see it. And in fact, I remember um, reading probably in about 2007 or eight, an incredibly useful article written by um, a scholar in the United States called Elizabeth Hurd, who has since become very much more well known. But at the time, I think it was one of those first papers given at a first conference, and I happened to be at that conference. And she describes how um, when the hostage crisis began, what happened in the majority of, of schools and uh, um, university classrooms around the country was that in the United States was that people had only had only ever heard about Israel as a part of, uh, as the Middle East. They didn't really know about that much of the other parts of the, the, the world in that region. And so the first encounter they had was Iranians looking like revolutionaries marching the you know, the embassy staff in front of the uh, embassy in, you know, their eyes covered in, in bloody bandanas and just was absolutely set up to make it an us versus them. A, you know, this was their first encounter. And I think that that certainly conditioned a great deal of what was going on. I think what's interesting is that from Iran's perspective, it is, it, it is incredibly important. Um, it was also fundamentally misunderstood on both sides, which I thought by being right in it, I thought was really interesting. It was immediately taken up and misinterpreted or reinterpreted or interpreted for different reasons to be different things by both sides using quite different facts or interpretations of facts. And I think that what got lost was uh, all of the elements that actually would make unraveling this not so difficult. And, um, but it, 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 by having, whitewashed out or ignored so many of the things that were important and instead really featured those things that weren't or that were less important to the relationship of two countries. So for example, one of the things that certainly happened, I mean, the United States is actually, one of the things that is fascinating is the United States has, has encountered this very same kind of situation of entire embassies being taken and sequestered for a year in Indochina at the time before it became sort of Vietnam and you know the and 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 uh, Cambodia and Laos that happened and nothing happened i mean the us sort of waited until the people were released and everybody got out fine and that was it but this one was immediately um, one of the first things that happened was that the embassy people were no longer construed in the American press as officials of the American government. They were construed as American families. And that's what started the whole yellow ribbon movement, which sort of popularized the whole thing. Everybody wore yellow ribbons. And the whole idea that they were doing government work was lost that they therefore had taken on the risk by as a profession that this is part of what goes on uh, when representing a country and instead were sort of refashioned into this set of victims of uh, that had no had no reason to be victims. Something that happened on the Iran side was that um, just by chance, the acceptance of the Shah into the United States, which is what triggered the whole thing. He was brought in for medical reasons and the Iranian government was never informed before he, that would happen. Happened to be on the most important Shia day of the year, Moharram. And so the Americans that did this surely didn't know this. 
or if they did, they weren't listened to at the point where he was accepted. But this was the kind of thing that for Iranians was absolutely clearly it had been symbolically timed. Clearly there was more to this. And that's why the association in Iran was, well, then that's going to be a repeat of what happened in the 1950s when the American coup overthrew um, the prime minister who had nationalized oil. And so, and which took place in the American embassy and that was a coup. So these are things that get lost in translation. And I think, you know, are um, the elements that have been in many ways reinterpreted and misinterpreted. And yes, I, my one, you know, tick at the top of the boxes of all of the problems is probably I would still put it as the hostage crisis, even if people don't remember it, even if people don't know that that's what the problem is, that's what it is still. It was a hugely shaming um, experience for the United States and um, and for Iran, basically, both of them. Thank you. Thanks very much, Roxanne. We have um, a couple of a couple of more questions. Uh, one was um, uh, a couple of follow up. Uh, well, one follow up question on on that. Um, which was, do you think the cultural divide makes it harder to negotiate with Iran? And in that sense, makes it a misunderstood state. Um, and then another little clarification question about um, with your Al Jazeera grant, did you have completely unrestricted reporting uh, and research? So let me answer the second one first, because that's the easy one, because it's a one word answer and the word is yes. Um, absolutely. I mean, we could not have had that grant uh, accepted without the contract ensuring that. We also had full control over all publication, um, which was, of course, something new for Al Jazeera. I mean, it, 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 it's a publishing company. Why would they have rights to everything that we found uh, out and would, you know, publish and not publish? But that was absolutely, you know, in stone in terms of the contract. It was a complicated contract and it was really fascinating. And, and I think it, in, it, it really was a success. I think we both learned how, to, how two huge organizations, they kept saying, oh, two huge organizations working together that couldn't be more different. Well, indeed, and, and it was, it was a, a felicitous relationship, I think. We both came out happy with, with what emerged. Uh, back to the Iranian thing. I don't quite understand what the word, uh, how you're using the word in your question of cultural differences, but the United States and Iran have both succeeded in, in undertaking many significant negotiations with cultures that are not their own. And I would say that about, of, of among the countries in the world, they are two extremely well-placed countries in terms of being able to get over cultural divides. Um, I mean, the United States is the country, is the, is, the, is, the, is the great power that came to power on the back of alliances. It was the first global world in terms of a, a, a power and that's how it's done it, is, is negotiating with other cultures and bringing them on side and coming up with huge concepts such as all the international institutions that brought on every culture, if you will, into things like the WTO and the WHO and whatever. And Iran is at the center of the Silk Road. It has always negotiated multicultural. It is many, many cultures itself, in fact. Um, and, you know, Shia, Sunni, Kurds, um, Azerbaijanis, I mean, they just, it, it, it's the, it often has called itself the, you know, the many states of Iran. And so in, if, in essence, I don't see that as the problem. I think they're both very open to, to being able to negotiate and f in the right circumstances as Obama and Rouhani who brought the, two, the, the nuclear deal together. It took leadership, it took grit and it worked. Uh, it took those two characters to bring two countries together. And, um, and I think the opposite can be said um, that in withdrawing from the deal, it was a different kind of character uh, and set of characters. And so I think a lot of it has to do with leadership and political will. Just to jump in on, on that one, Roxanne, what, what do you think about the future of the deal? 
Well, I have to admit, talk about think tank work. It seems like that's what I'm doing at the moment is, is weighing in and trying to read the Biden administration tea leaves. And um, I, I, I have to admit right at the moment, I'm not quite sure where it's going. I think uh, on the one hand, many of us who are supporters, and I put myself strongly into that of the nuclear deal, the JCPOA, um, had expected that it would move more quickly on the Biden side. Um, in many ways, it's the, to recapture it as the low hanging fruit. It's mm -hmm. negotiated, we know what's in it. And the key thing about it is it's a verification system. It's simply the instrument that ensures that nuclear development doesn't take place in Iran. It dropped when the JCPOA was signed. It started going up once it was over. And, um, and I think any of us would sleep more soundly in our beds if we knew that as an arms agreement, it was back on track. Mm. And so I think we had hoped that that would happen more rapidly. And there are many, many ways that the Europeans who have kept the deal raggedly alive uh, on its last feet, nonetheless alive, had developed for sort of simultaneous ways that both countries could get back in and save face and, and be able to reconstitute that part of it. And, um, and then what's often forgotten is that the deal was uh, negotiated as uh, something that would have flanking diplomacy. In other words, yeah. that other negotiations on missiles, on regional security, on mm -hmm. even possibly militias, it didn't specify at all, uh, but it was understood that all of those agreements would follow next. Mm -hmm. So I think at this point, it's a little disconcerting that we're moving from a phrase of compliance with compliance, which would mean the US coming back on with a reduction in sanctions, with Iran coming back on and dropping the enrichment. Um, so both of them complying. Now we're talking and beginning to hear the phrase freezing for freezing, which in some sense is a little less uh, warming to the soul. And, um, and I don't see that necessarily working very well because of two important things. One key thing is that there is a presidential election that is coming up in June and the current uh, reformists have been very badly damaged in Iran by the failure of the, of the JCPOA, the nuclear deal. And so the likelihood of them retaining power is almost zero, uh, but the likelihood of a more moderate hardliner, if there could be such a thing, is now beginning to, to recede if some form of the JCPOA does not come back on. It will be a country that is sanctioned, has a nuclear program, and an extremely um, uncomfortable and uh, armed to the teeth set of neighbors. And so the temperature in the Gulf will be running high. So that being the other part of it. So I think we're all hoping that the Biden administration can find some way forward to get this uh, in operation before that election takes place. Because once a hardliner comes on, I think it's gonna be over for a while. Mm -hmm. I think you may have, have answered one of the, the follow-up questions, which was about who do you think is going to take um, the lead in moving, you know, getting the deal back on track, that you think it will be the Biden administration rather than the Iranian side? Um, well, I think it's both. Mm. But um, to be really specific, it was the American administration that left the deal yeah. and Iran stayed in it for another full year. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, the Iran deal was put together not, not based on trust. It was based on distrust. But the yeah. distrust was basically all heading one direction. And that was about Iran. I mean, the distrust was Iran was going to make a bomb. Iran had to be contained. And um, so the deal reflects that set of limitations on Iran. Uh, should it break its compliance. The deal has no partnering 
constraints on any other party of the deal breaking their, mm. their part of, of the agreement. So nobody anticipated that the United States would be the one that would stop complying. Mm. And as a result, the only response Iran had within the terms of the deal was to go back and start making nuclear mm. material. It did, there, were, there are no other elements to it. That's, that's what this deal happens to cover. And that's what makes it such a technical deal and why in many ways this deal, in my view, is simply a way to verify and keep Iran's nuclear deal contained. But in any case, that's why Iran stayed in it. But it feels very strongly that having signed an international deal, complied with the deal, it then had one of the parties leave the deal and reimpose sanctions. So it feels, and I think with some justification, that at least the two should be working in tandem to get back in, um, but that the United States should indicate in some way that it plans to fulfill a commitment to get back in. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that the U.S. is the only one to do it. They both are now in breach. Um, but I think the Iranians feel that one of the problems with the existing deal is that there's nothing that will guarantee a future administration not coming back, in, uh, mm. not withdrawing, should the Biden administration come in. Mm. So there, it it is extremely interested in having follow-on <laughs> negotiations about mm. a number of things, but particularly <laughs> that. Mm. So it's 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 once again, as I felt all the way through the years of watching these two countries. I think they share a great deal of common, even in this deal. It's how do we get there? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a really fascinating insight into you know into the deal and where we where we are today. Um, we have one last question, which we may not have we may not be able to do in a minute. <laughs> okay, I'll try to keep it short. Uh, but I think this is somebody maybe thinking about um, future future study or things that they want to go on to do. Um, but they would uh, like to see your, uh, hear your views about what are the most pressing topics regarding divided societies in your research? What are kind of the hot topics to do? Well, right now, especially if you're looking at the Middle East, but really anywhere, but the Middle East in particular, the societies are become, becoming divided partially because of climate change. The, the, the land is running out, the water, you know, it's drying. The, the Sahara is expanding at 25 miles a, a year all around its perimeter. That's pushing people out to the edges. Um, and so to me, societies are gonna become increasingly pressed and divided as a result as, this, as, as just food and water and, and employment and all of that that comes uh, from a more restful setting um, become stretched. And so I would say one of the most important elements in divided societies certainly is that, I mean, it's across the board. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but it's actually a very, very important area, I think, particularly around divided societies. And I think one of the things we're also finding is that um, partially because of media, uh, partially because of the uh, fragmentation within uh, divided societies, we're also finding that a lot of uh, conflict is now taking place in cities again. Mm -hmm. It's no longer large um, militaries, you know, exchanging battle on the plains of wherever it's in the roads and this and the alleyways of our cities and so i think our cities are at risk and i think they are very much what divided societies are uh their 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 encounters are closed their the migration is is filling them up i mean we have such a good example right now in in beirut um mm -hmm. and and i think there are others that are like that um so i would i would proceed to look at those kinds of areas as subjects. It's a rich area. I think almost anything that you can do uh, mm -hmm. to help um, understand and, and bring new insight will be extraordinarily rich in terms of um, a career direction. 
Thank you very much, Roxanne, for this fantastically wide ranging um, talk and, you know, taking us through your your journey as, um, you know, as a journalist, as an academic, as a, as a policy commentator, um, and also offering some, you know, great insight into what's happening uh, in the Middle East today as well. So thank you very much. We're delighted to have you in the Center for the Study of Divided Societies, delighted to have you um, in War Studies, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Stacy. What a wonderful interviewer you are. <laughs> <laughs> it was really fun. Thank you, everyone.